We're in part five of a series called Flawed because this series deals with two letters written by the Apostle Paul to the flawed church in Corinth. Like most churches, they had some issues. You know, I've spent my life trying to not be an issue for any of the pastors I've had. Um, I've really worked hard at that, actually. Um, despite their deficiencies, however, the church in Corinth was still the perfect church for imperfect people because the church isn't a museum where we put godly people on display and try to impress others with our righteousness. The church is a hospital where anybody, hurting people, can come to get help. And so that's why uh, both of the letters uh, of, uh, to, of Paul to the Corinthians are important, um, and especially this first letter uh, he writes so much to this church, more than any other group. He had spent 18 months establishing this church. You can read about that in Acts 18, and we read this verse in that chapter. God said to Paul in a night vision, don't be afraid, but you speak and don't hold your peace. For I am with thee, no man shall set on thee to hurt thee. And here's the word of God to Paul about the city of Corinth. For I have much people in this city. I've said it before in this series, I'm sure I'll say it again. If God could build a church in the city of Corinth, he can surely build a great apostolic church in the city of Fredericton or anywhere else for that matter. Um, it was after Paul's departure that the church did develop some fairly serious issues. And many of them were caused by Christians who had allowed the sin of the city to influence their beliefs, and then when your beliefs get influenced, your behavior gets influenced. And so Paul writes these letters for this reason. Um, when God's people don't walk in the Spirit, it's all too usual and typical for our old carnal flesh nature to try to reassert itself. And it uh, reasserts its desires. It begins to manifest its dysfunctions. And the end result can be tragic. We end up hurting ourselves and we hurt others. And we heard the testimony of the church in the city when we don't act like Christians. Um, unfortunately, that's what happened to this flawed church in Corinth. And so uh, we're going to dive back in tonight and we're going to deal with some issues that Paul dealt with. And tonight, I think in particular, out of all the lessons that we will study about this book in this series, uh, tonight I want to say that we don't shy away from the challenging passages of the Word of God. If the Word of God says it, we try our best to obey it. If the Word of God deals with it, we try our best to grapple with it, and that's what we're going to do tonight. So uh, this is Bible study, and we're going to dig a little deeper than what we would do in a, a, a preaching message on Sunday. And uh, so if you want to buckle your seatbelt, that's fine. Uh, if you want to just hang loose, that's good too. Here we go. You see, the Corinthians have been influenced by a sinister philosophy of their city. And the philosophy of their culture and our culture today is anything goes or do whatever feels good to you or my life is my business. That was the philosophy of Corinth. The way they used to say it 2,000 years ago is the Corinthians would say all things are lawful. Get out of my face. I can do what I want. All things are lawful for me. And Paul refutes that with what we've called his three ethical laws. And I rehearse this again in your hearing tonight because it's very important for what comes next. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 12, Paul quotes their phrase, all things are lawful, but then he challenges it. Here's what he says, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. He adds one more clause to that argument in chapter 10 and verse 23. He repeats this part, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient, beneficial, uh, good for me. Uh, and then he adds this, all things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. And so what I like to call Paul's three ethical laws, all things are lawful, but first of all, is what I'm about to do advisable for my actions? 
because all things are not expedient. If I do it, it doesn't mean it's going to be helpful. It doesn't mean it's going to be beneficial. It doesn't mean it's going to be good for me. Uh, and so I need to consider that. Is this advisable for my actions? Secondly, um, all things are lawful, but second question, is this beneficial for the body? Not your body, the body of Christ. He says, all things edify not. And in this book, like many other places in the New Testament, he tells us that we have a responsibility as members of the body to edify the body, to build it up, not tear it down, not damage it or hurt it or weaken it, but to build it up. And so the second question we should ask when we're considering something is, is this beneficial for the body of Christ? If people see me do this and they would imitate me in any way, would it help them or hinder them? And so he talks about that. And thirdly, uh, all things are lawful, but is this constructive for my character? Uh, and here's what he means by that. He says, I will not be brought under the power of any. I could do it today, perhaps, and it wouldn't hurt me today. I might be able to do it for the next six months and it might not hurt me for the next six months, but we have to be honest enough to ask ourselves this question. If I do this for several years, honestly, transparently, looking inward, will I be closer to God because of this, or will I be further away from God because of this? Will my commitment to his church be tighter or will it be looser? Will my, my commitment to the body of Christ, will I be more knit to the body of Christ or will I be divided somehow from the members of my church? And so uh, is it constructive for my character? Because Paul said, even if it was good for me today, I won't be brought under the power of anything. Some things are not so bad in one dose, but they have an accumulative effort uh, over time, this, this impact uh, that, that just devastates your spiritual life. And so we have to be honest. Now, there are many areas in Corinth where this faulty, all things are lawful philosophy had had an incredibly damaging effect. We've already talked about some of them. Usually it was when somebody exercised their personal liberty to do what they wanted at the expense of the church's unity. Now, this is really, really important. Some of the issues they faced no longer apply to us today. But in every case, the principles Paul taught are universal and they are eternal. So let's begin with just a tiny bit of review. Here are three examples of this from last time uh, we were together. First of all, 1 Corinthians 8 verse 9. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. You see, in Corinth, it was lawful, but it was not wise for them to eat meat that had been sacrificed to pagan idols. Some of the stronger believers, some that had been there for a long time, they knew that an idol was nothing. It couldn't affect the meat that they bought cheaper at the market after it had been sacrificed before a pagan idol. They knew that didn't affect that piece of steak. However, while it was lawful, it was not wise because this was offensive to weaker believers. And some of them that had been part of that pagan worship system, they couldn't understand why anyone would buy meat that had been offered to an idol. And so it was just better to not exercise that right. So it was lawful, but it was not wise. Uh, secondly, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 25. Paul talks about our personal lives. Every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now, they do it. The world does it. Uh, they, they discipline themselves to try to achieve a corruptible crown. In the Olympics, in a race, in a contest, in business, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. That's why they discipline themselves. But Paul said, no, we do it to receive an incorruptible crown. So he's telling the people, it is lawful for you to do really anything you want short of sin. It's lawful, but it's not always wise for you to do everything that you want to do just because it's not technically a sin. 
In the first case, eating meat offered to idols, that was harmful to weaker believers. But this time around, Paul said, if you do everything that you want to do and you put no restrictions on your flesh or your desires or your wants or your greeds, he said, what you're doing is you are harmful to yourself. And so you've got to be careful. It is lawful. You can't technically say it's a sin. But it's not wise when you think about it. And then thirdly from last week, 1 Corinthians 10 verse uh, 33. Even as I please all men in all things, watch this, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many that they may be saved. You see, a Christian can insist on all of their rights. Yeah, you can tell off your boss. You can tell off everybody on Facebook with your political opinions and all of your wisdom. You can. It's technically lawful. And there are some Christians that are very athletic when it comes to dodging any kind of command from the Word of God. And uh, they, they can come up with all kinds of excuses as to why it is right for them to uh, vomit out all of their personal opinions all over social media. Yes, Paul said, you can exercise all your personal rights. It's lawful, but it's not wise. Why isn't it wise? Paul said, I'm trying to please everybody because I want to reach as many as I can that they may be saved. So if I do this, it's technically lawful, but it's not wise because it offends those that we want to reach. Uh, Right now, there are all kinds of conflicts in the world. I know you have your opinions. I certainly have mine. If you want to talk about it in private, I've got lots of opinions. If you've got 300 Pentecostals in a room, there are at least 529 opinions in that same room. We've got opinions. We're not short on opinions. But to get on your Facebook page and broadcast those opinions about one group or the other, one side or the other, uh, one political party or the other... It's technically lawful, but it's sure not wise. Oh, you didn't all die or walk out. Good, okay. So, in every case, those things were lawful, but they were definitely not wise. That's what Paul is trying to say. He's using his three ethical laws to show us that sometimes it's technically okay to do. It's technically not a sin. But think in the Holy Ghost, not just think in the manner of the world. And so, since you survived those three, here are three more examples that we will learn about tonight. I'll give you the bird's eye view and then we'll dive in. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 13. Judge in yourselves, is it comely, is it becoming that a woman pray unto God uncovered? So one of the things he's going to tackle is... It is lawful, but it's not wise for their women in Corinth to stop wearing their head veil in that city. Why? Because it was offensive to their culture. And we'll dive in. Secondly, chapter 11, verse 33. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry, wait one for another. It was lawful, but it was not wise for them to flaunt their personal blessings and wealth when they celebrated communion together, leaving some members of the church out. That was offensive to the church. And then thirdly tonight, we'll dive into this, chapter 12, verse 14. For the body is not one member, but many. It was lawful. You couldn't point out a sin in this. It was technically okay for them to value one spiritual gift above another spiritual gift. Technically, you can't say, well, that's a sin because you prefer someone to prophesy instead of somebody to exercise the gift of faith. You can't technically say that's wrong, but it surely wasn't wise. Why? Because that was offensive to God himself who gave all of the spiritual gifts. So in each case, uh, what we'll look at tonight, in one case, it's lawful, but it's not wise because it offends their culture. In the second instance, it's technically lawful, but it's not wise because it offends the church family. And thirdly, it's technically lawful, but it's definitely not wise because it's offensive to God himself 
who gave us spiritual gifts. So once again, here's what Paul is trying to teach us. Some things in your life, they are lawful. You can't find a thou shalt not, but if you think in the Holy Ghost, instead of thinking with worldly mindsets, you will soon come to the opinion that it's lawful, but it's not wise. So what I'd ask you to do tonight is as we're studying, some of these things still apply to us. Some of them, uh, the situations don't, but the principles do. And I'd ask you personally to listen carefully for God's voice as we study His Word. This is why we come to Bible study, not because we've got some extraordinarily gifted communicator teaching the Bible class. That's not why we come to Bible study. We come to Bible study to hear the Word of God and to hear the voice of God to us personally out of the Word of God. So here's what I'd ask you to consider tonight. Could God be convicting you of something that is lawful Technically, you defend it. This is lawful. There's no thou shalt not. Pastor doesn't preach against this. Could there be anything in your life that is lawful but not wise if you really think about it? It's not drawing you closer to the Lord. In fact, it is making you more sleepy, spiritually speaking. Uh, you're, You're dozing off just before the last of the last days and the end of the end times and the coming of the Lord, and you're being lulled to sleep because you're buying into worldly philosophies like the Corinthian church did. So just consider that. So uh, so we've got three little scenarios, and, and we'll just kind of try to move through. And again, I would say to everybody here, uh, this church, we don't back away from passages of the Word of God that are difficult or demanding. In other words, some passages demand a change in our lifestyle, and we don't back away from those. Many churches, many denominations, many Christians do. We do not. If it's challenging, if it's demanding, uh, if it's a little difficult, we lean in. We don't lean away. So let's consider the background of this first passage. We're in chapter 11, if you're following along in your Bible. In ancient times, Women were generally regarded as a possession of their husbands. That's not just in Corinth. That's everywhere in the ancient world. It was terrible and tragic, but it was the way culture was. And so in Corinth, women wore a head covering as a symbol of that submission. It was submission to their husbands if they were married or submission to their fathers if they were unmarried. It was very similar to the head coverings that you would see in traditional Islamic cultures today, but not the face veil, just a a head covering. The only exceptions to that practice were temple prostitutes who sometimes would cut or shave their hair and they would offer that hair on an altar. You see on the screen to your left, Uh, an actual picture. This wasn't in Corinth. It was in another city of ancient Rome, but it's an ancient altar, and you can see twin uh, braids of hair symbolizing that that was an altar on which hair from uh, these people would be offered before pagan idols. On the other side, you see a more modern picture, and that is from India, where also there are people who will shave their heads. Uh, Women will shave their heads in an act of worship to their gods, and they will offer that. What they don't realize, and that picture comes from an article, what they don't realize is that they think they're making some sacrifice to a god, but the the people behind those pagan temples take all that hair and uh, make wigs out of it. They sell it. And those poor people uh, don't even realize what's happening uh, to them. Uh, So this is an ancient practice that has some bearing in certain places in our modern world. So the temple prostitutes, they were an exception to the head covering. They would actually walk the streets of Corinth without a veil often just kind of using that as an advertisement. If you saw a woman without a veil on, you knew she worked in the temple as a prostitute. So modest women in Corinth, whether they were apostolic believers or not, they certainly would not want to be associated with that kind of immorality. 
Now, a difficulty comes into the picture because when Paul's message of salvation was introduced to the Corinthians and to the rest of the New Testament world, Paul emphasized that men and women, it wasn't like their culture said, men and women were equally valuable in God's sight. In fact, he tells us in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28, there's neither Jew nor Greek, so race doesn't matter. There's neither bond nor free, that's, that's uh, slave owners or slave, slaves themselves, uh, so status doesn't matter. And then he says, and there's neither male nor female, so your gender doesn't matter. You are all one in Christ Jesus. Your race, your status, your gender, uh, your wealth level, your socioeconomic uh, background, none of that matters to God. Everyone is equal at the foot of the cross. So that's wonderful, and it's true, and Paul taught it emphatically. However, some of the women in the Corinthian church took Paul's teaching to an extreme. Well, we're the same as the men in God's sight, so they discarded their head coverings. After all, we're equal to all the brothers in the church in God's sight. It was lawful, but it wasn't wise. They didn't even stop to think for a second that in the eyes of their city, their actions in taking off their head covering was offending their culture's idea of submission to male headship. And even worse, it was unintentionally identifying themselves with temple prostitutes who cut or shaved their hair to offer it on pagan altars. And so that's why Paul emphatically declares Ladies, we love you, but discarding your head covering in Corinth is not wise. It's sending out an entirely wrong signal to our culture. And so he wades in pretty sternly. Every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered, she's dishonoring her head. Her husband, if she's married, her her, uh, father, if she's unmarried, it is even all one. It's, It's basically in the eyes of our culture, it's the very same as if she were shaven. They think you're a temple prostitute. So again, here we go. Is it lawful? Technically, yes. But Paul said, but it's not wise to do this, ladies. So Paul does this, he's he's brilliant, he's anointed, he's amazing. He's dealing with the issue of a cloth veil on their head, but he's so apostolically brilliant that he uses this issue as a chance to teach something far more powerful. While their culture took the practice of submission to an extreme, Paul now takes the time to explain that the principle of submission is not about Corinth. It goes all the way back to creation. And in the process of explaining the difference between an extreme practice and an eternal principle, uh, Paul, he gives us some beautiful and powerful teaching about women's hair. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11 verse 15. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. The first thing Paul teaches is that before God, a woman's long hair, the Greek word is komeo, you can look it up. It means hair that is permitted to grow without cutting it. So it's uncut hair is the way we would say it. And before God... Her cameo hair, her uncut hair, is two things. It is her glory. God is pleased she reflects his glory. It's her glory. But also, it's her covering. Paul said, ladies, you already have a covering. I know you don't need the cloth veil. That's got nothing to do with God. That's got nothing to do with Scripture. That's got nothing to do with God's command. I'm just saying it's not wise to walk around Corinth without your veil on because you're unintentionally identifying yourself with sin. But he said, ladies, God doesn't look at you differently because of a hat you've got on your head or a veil you've got on your head. He knows that he created you different than a man, and your long hair, your uncut hair, is your glory, and it's your covering. It serves as your real veil in God's sight. 
And then he can't stop because he's so apostolically brilliant. He also teaches this. It's one of the most powerful verses in all of Paul's epistles. Verse 10. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. You read the first 16 verses of chapter 11. It's all about headship. Paul's talking about headship in Corinthian culture. And so ladies, it would be lawful for you not to wear a veil, but it wouldn't be wise. You should honor your culture because we're trying to reach our culture. But then he segues from that to the eternal issue, the creation issue. And he said, ladies... Because you are willingly, cheerfully submitted to God's order from creation, because you're not trying to be a man, you're not trying to usurp the place of a man, you're glad that God made you who you are. He said, because the angels see your submission. The holy angels see it, they were there and saw the order of creation. And the fallen angels, the demons, they see your submission. They also were there at the dawn of creation. For this cause... Ought the woman, what cause? Because of all of God's creation, God's order, and the angelic realm. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. And that word power is exousia. It literally means restraining power. And it speaks of a godly woman's prayer life when she is submitted to God's order. She has restraining power on her head. I have fun with this when I'm in the southern U.S. sometimes or somewhere that's warmer than here, especially in the winter. And if some pastor asks me to teach on some of this to their church, I'll often make this comment. Many things in Scripture are word pictures. And when I am in Florida and I say blizzard, none of them think of snow. They all think about Dairy Queen because their word picture is different than our word picture. When I say blizzard here, I think of my driveway and thank God that I'm away and somebody else is shoveling it. By the way, if you ever drive by our house and you see Beverly out shoveling snow, I have commanded her not to do that, but I'm struggling with her submission and and, uh, told her to wait for somebody else, but we're working. So anyway, uh, I digress. Uh, Counseling, therapy, I need it all. Okay, so this picture is a godly woman in a posture. The picture here that Paul gives is a godly woman with a posture of restraint. She hasn't opened her mouth to exhort, to testify, to preach, to sing, to do anything. All she did was walked on the premises, but because she is willingly, cheerfully submitted to God's order of creation through what she does with her hair, the angels recognize it. The holy angels are drawn to her submission, and the fallen angels flee from her submission. She's powerful before she ever opens her mouth. And the picture here is of a godly woman in a posture of restraint. She's saying, no devil, you can't have my husband, you can't have my children, you can't have my family, you can't attack my marriage, stay out of my church, don't touch my pastor. She hasn't even opened her mouth yet. Her submission before the angelic realm already says that. And it's very powerful. So uh, we don't have time. If you're interested, we got uh, all kinds of stuff, pages and pages on all this that you can access uh, from our church or just speak to one of us. We'll be glad to help you. But let's summarize. So we're, we're talking about two issues. The veil that Paul is asking them to wear because to not wear it, it would be lawful not to wear it, but not wise. And so we're talking about a veil, but then he segues into a woman's uncut hair. So here it is. The veil is a temporary practice. It's not going to last forever. It's done in honor to man. It comes from culture. And furthermore, it applies only to Corinth. But the hair... That is an eternal principle. It's done not in honor to man, not in honor to the rules of a church. It's done in honor to God. It dates all the way back to creation, and it applies to the church in every culture. In fact, he says in verse 16, if you want to argue about this, we have no other custom, neither any of the other churches of God. All of the churches agree on this, that a woman's uh, long hair, cameo hair, uncut hair is her covering and the angels see it and God is pleased with it. Now, in today's culture, 
we do not, let me be very clear, we do not view a woman's head covering as a sign of submission. Doesn't happen today. In fact, in most modern societies, scarves and hats and pins and hairdos and crazy hairdos are merely fashion accessories. I had to get that one in. So, an apostolic woman, one of the things I love about New Brunswick is we really don't do crazy hairdos here. Thank you. So, an apostolic woman, she doesn't have to wear a head covering as that is just a cultural practice. But she does choose to have uncut hair because that is a creation principle. Is there ever a time in the modern era of the apostolic church when a woman should wear a head covering? Yes, absolutely. The only time she would need to wear a head covering is if the culture she is in has a higher standard than what God's Word requires. And a good example would be our wonderful missionaries who work in the Muslim world. They don't wear a head covering because it makes them different in God's eyes, but they wear a head covering so as not to offend the culture before we have a chance to reach that culture. Just like in Corinth, Paul's saying an apostolic woman would observe this practice not because God requires it, but because we want to win that culture to the Lord. Amen. Everyone say amen. Let's move on. By the way, uh, goodness, our missionaries are just wonderful. They are so deserving of your prayers and your support. Uh, once again, let's dive in, consider the background of this next little section of 1 Corinthians. This is chapter 11. In the early days of the church, Christians celebrated the Lord's Supper with feasts, literal feasts. However, in Corinth, this had gotten way out of hand. Their communion services had been corrupted with selfishness, flaunting of their social status, humiliation of poorer church members, divisions in the church family, and even drunkenness on occasion. It was scandalous. They were near, neither honoring God nor edifying one another in their observance of communion. So once again, Paul, bold as a lion, wades into the controversy. Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that you come together not for the better, but for the worse. Paul says communion is an act of worship meant to commemorate Jesus' sacrifice and celebrate unity among the members of his body. But in Corinth, the way they acted was actually magnifying the inequalities and divisions among them. And Paul said, and it's doing far more harm than it is good. Communion, doing far more harm than it is good. You see, some wealthy members, when they came to the feast, they brought an abundance of food, while some poor members came and they had absolutely nothing to eat. And that's why Paul emphatically declares something, that we should enjoy our perks and our privileges privately. If Paul was living in 2024, I know he would say, stop using social media to humble brag. I know he would say that. It would be in 1 Corinthians 11. He says to them in verse 22, What? You've got houses to eat and drink in. Are you despising the church of God? You're disrespecting our gatherings? And you're shaming the brothers and sisters that don't have all the perks and privileges that you have? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? Now this is the understatement of the century. I praise you not. I'm not happy with you people. So again, Paul's using this same principle. See, they've been polluted by the idea of their culture. But it's lawful. There's nothing wrong if I have a whole lot of stuff and if I have a whole lot of money and if I have a whole lot of food and if I get to enjoy all the good things of life and all the perks and privileges and blessings and benefits, there's nothing technically wrong with it. It's lawful. Paul said, yeah, it's lawful technically But is it wise? Definitely not. 
Now, while their church, this is the same thing that Paul just did with veils and hair, now he's going to do with, with the celebration of communion, which had got to an extreme. But he's going to show us, out of the middle of this problem, the consecration of communion. He, he's going to take something they were doing wrong, and he's going to turn it, and he's going to teach us something so powerful uh, and so beautiful about communion. In fact, we still read Paul's words that he writes in this chapter nearly every time we celebrate communion today. We read these words. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Paul gives the Corinthians a very strong warning. Do not... Take communion unworthily. Now that's a far different word than unworthy because we're all unworthy of God's sacrifice and of his shed blood. So unworthily doesn't mean unworthy. Unworthily means to partake of communion irreverently, disrespectfully, flippantly, contemptuously, or the big one, just casually. It means to partake of communion in a manner that doesn't honor Jesus' sacrifice. And Paul gets very emphatic here because to him it is a very serious thing. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily is eating and drinking damnation to himself because he doesn't discern the Lord's body. Now remember the context of this passage. Context is always important. What comes before and after what Paul's actually talking about. He is not just talking about not discerning the Lord's physical body that hung on the cross. That's important, but that's not all he's talking about. He's also talking about discerning the Lord's spiritual body that we are now a part of. He's saying when you don't love honor and prefer your brothers and sisters in the church, there are serious consequences. You look at verse uh, 30 and it says, even weakness, sickness, premature death, and we just read it from verse 29, or eternal damnation. All of those things can result because people do not honor the Lord's body his church, their brothers and sisters. So Paul just did something powerful. This isn't just about the communion service. It's about how we commune with each other every single day of our lives. You can't come and celebrate communion and say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins when you intend to go from that service and still dismiss and disrespect and disregard your brothers and your sisters. It's not just his physical body that was crucified on the cross. It's his spiritual body, the church. Paul's ramped up a little bit here because he sees the potential of this church in Corinth. He got a word from God. I have much people in this city. And yet he sees the church cannibalizing their potential to reach Corinth. They're offending each other. They're offending their culture. They're offending the people they want to reach. They're hurting themselves. And he's wanting to correct all of this. So you pardon Paul if he gets a little bit emphatic. One final time, let's consider the background of the passage. We've now, uh, we're, we're now moving uh, into uh, chapter 12. And Paul says that the church in Corinth, you're spiritually gifted. You're spiritually gifted. But sadly, although you're spiritually gifted, you're not always spiritually sensitive. You should be. But you're not. In the same way that you tend to exalt certain preachers above other preachers, Corinth, you tend to exalt certain spiritual gifts above other spiritual gifts. You tend to exalt certain ministries above other ministries. You even tend to exalt certain church members above other church members. You have allowed the celebrity culture of your city to pollute your church. And so one more time, Paul patiently explains just why this attitude is so harmful and he gives them a spiritual 
anatomy lesson about the body of Christ. So we're in chapter 12, verse 18 to 20. But now hath God set the members, every one of them in the body, as it hath pleased him. If everybody were one member, if everybody had the same function in the body, where would the body be? We wouldn't have a body if everybody was an ear or everyone was an eye or everyone was a hand. But now are they many members. We've got all kinds of different functions and backgrounds and giftings, but it's still one body. Now, if you want to go deeper on this subject, uh, I think it was last year, uh, there's a very short two-part series uh, on our website, um, on uh, capitalcommunity.tv. It's called God's Gift to the Church, and the lesson is called Ninefold, and you can knock yourself out on 1 Corinthians chapter 12. But for tonight, in summary, there are several images of the church in the New Testament. It's called a family, an army, a temple, a bride, and a body. Every one of those images has important lessons to teach us, but Paul emphasizes the body metaphor in three different epistles. And what's really interesting is every time Paul talks at length about the body of Christ, he boils it down to the same three truths. If you're going to have a body, you've got to have unity, you've got to allow diversity, and you've got to live with maturity. Always the same three truths. And maturity is the, is the linchpin, it's the keystone, because you can't have unity with people that aren't like you if you're not a mature Christian. You'll always be fighting them. You'll always be looking down on them. You'll always be envious of them. You can't have unity without maturity. And also, you can't have diversity in the body without maturity because you'll expect everybody to be just like you, think just like you, uh, have the same preferences as you. You can't have unity or diversity without maturity. Now, in Corinth, members of the body were grieving the Holy Ghost by the way they were using the spiritual gifts that God had given to them. They were not in unity. They did not appreciate the body's diversity. And most of all, they just lacked maturity. Now, Paul wades in, and uh, we're going to breeze through this very quickly, but there's a lot of information packed in here. In verse 4 to 6, he says, Now, there are diversities of gifts, but it's all the same spirit. And there are differences of administrations, But it's all the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. Let me summarize very quickly. Within the body of Christ, there are diversities. There are differences or distinctions or uh, various distributions of three things. He says there's gifts. These would be what we would call supernatural gifts. They are the God moments when there's a message in tongues and it's interpreted. When an evangelist steps into the the realm of the gift of faith and healings occur. Uh, When when a pastor, uh, he has a word of knowledge. He didn't come to the service to preach that sermon knowing what he was going to say or knowing what he'd deal with, but he speaks something and it's directly for someone. It's a word of knowledge. It comes straight from the Holy Ghost. Those are supernatural gifts. They're God moments. Only God can do those. But please hear me if you don't hear anything else tonight. Those are not the only kinds of gifts in the body of Christ. There are also administrations. Those are what we would call steering gifts. These are people who have abilities and they allow God to anoint their abilities. And because of that, they help steer the church. Don't you thank God we've got some people with technical abilities to run all this business? Don't you thank God we have people with musical abilities? Now, I know you listen to the keyboard players and you think, oh, well, God just gave them that. No, he didn't. They practiced that. My piano teacher, Mrs. Room, God rest her soul, or maybe punish her extra, she used to slap my wrists with with a ruler when I was practicing scales. And I used to play the keyboard. I know that seems really funny. Now that I'm, uh, no, I can't say elderly because Beverly's not and she's older than me. Uh, I'm mature. That's the word. I'm mature. And so, so 
that's, that's an anointed ability. The keyboard players, they have the ability. You can argue that all day long. Do they have natural ability? Well, you wouldn't want to hear it if they hadn't practiced a little bit. Because uh, they've all got some natural ability, but if they all come up here with just ability and nobody practices to play together, it's a little chaotic. But they have ability and they let God anoint it. Have you ever noticed that a musical selection uh, practiced by a team sung by people who have prayed can lift up a service and allow healing to move in the room and allow God's presence to move in? What is that? That's a steering gift. It helps steer the body of Christ. It's administration. It administrates. It steers. Uh, It's an anointed ability. And then for all of you that say, well, I can't do that. Well, that's fine because there's a third type of thing. Paul says there's operations. These are serving gifts. Do you know this church does not run by the number of people that you see on the platform every week? That is a poor pittance of a number of the people it actually takes to make this place run every week. There are people you never see because you don't have children anymore or you never did perhaps and you don't have any people downstairs tonight where they're working with kids. You don't have anybody in the youth chapel where they're working with kids. You don't have any of that and so you don't even think of that. But thank God there are various operations in the church. These are uh, all kinds of wonderful serving gifts, and I could summarize it like this. They're just willing workers. You don't even know the precious people that are on the visitation teams that lift up a a senior saint or a shut-in or somebody in the hospital with a visit and a prayer. You don't even know about that, but they're willing workers. They don't need to be on the stage, behind the pulpit. They're just willing workers. And Paul said, all of these things are given by God's Spirit. He uses it all. Somebody say all. All of these gifts are the manifestation of God's Spirit. He anoints it all for the benefit of His church. And Paul then focuses on supernatural gifts, the first category of the three. He doesn't focus on supernatural gifts because they're the most important. He focuses on them because they are typically the most misunderstood And so he talks about them and he lists them. And we won't take time to read that passage. We'll just summarize it like this. The nine supernatural gifts can be categorized in three basic groups. There are gifts of revelation where God says something uh, and, and reveals it that nobody would have any way of knowing. There are gifts of communication where, where he, he's not speaking to the inside of a person like when they have discerning of spirits, but he's actually uh, communicating with the body and it's spoken as an utterance. So there's revelation, that's internal to the person who has the gifts. There's communication, that's external for the sake of the body. And then there's gifts of demonstration where people are healed or miracles happen. All of those gifts, Paul says, they're important. Those are all supernatural. You can't do any of those without the Holy Ghost intervening in a God moment. Hear me one more time. But those are not the only kinds of gifts that God gives to his body. Thank God for the nine supernatural gifts. But if you've never had the experience of being used in any one of those gifts, you don't have to despair. God's probably given you another kind of gift that blesses the body. I thank God for every willing worker. I thank God for every anointed ability. All of those things are given to bless the body of of Christ. So, come and do a close here. Here's Paul's point. All gifts become spiritual gifts if they're used to benefit the body. Playing a keyboard becomes a spiritual gift if it's used to benefit the body. Running a crazy computer back in the sound booth becomes a spiritual gift if it's used to benefit the body. The Bible doesn't lock us into tight restrictions or rigid definitions of spiritual gifts. And God is not limited by these first century lists anyway. I'm firmly of the opinion that if Corinthians was being written today, Paul might talk about the gift of technology because some of the stuff that they pull off is amazing. 
So the lists given in Scripture are exemplary lists. They're examples of the gifts. They're not exhaustive lists. They're not every gift that has ever been given or ever could be given. So let's conclude here. According to Paul's spiritual anatomy lesson in the body of Christ, every member of the body is unique. Every member of the body is important. Some members of the body that are not very visible are essential to the body. I've never seen your heart or your lungs, but you wouldn't be here tonight were it not for your heart and your lungs. Some members of the body of Christ, you don't know who's praying for pastor this week. You don't know who's interceding for our church family. You don't know who's shaking the gates of heaven and saying, God, you got to send down revival in our city. You don't know. They're basically invisible, but they're so essential. In the body of Christ, according to Paul, members of the body should never compare or compete with each other. And then he says this. You can read it all. It's all here in chapter 12. No member of the body is important alone. You may think you're God's gift to the church and the kingdom of God, but no member of the body of Christ is important alone. Here's how we're important together. I think it was the old preacher Vance Havner who said, Christians are like snowflakes. That's a politicized word today, isn't it? Christians are like snowflakes. Alone, they're kind of frail. But when they get together, they can stop traffic. That's the body of Christ. Paul teaches in this lesson, we should give attention and honor to the weaker members of the body. Be on the lookout for somebody who's struggling. Be on the lookout for somebody who's brand new in the family of God. Be on the lookout for somebody who pastor hasn't thought to call their name, but if you walk by them in the lobby and said, I really appreciate how you work with our Sunday school or how you work in the ushering or the hostessing, if you did it, it's 10 times more valuable than pastor's commendation anyway. You know why? He's the paid professional. You're the satisfied customer. I'm so happy to belong to a church with people like you to bless their life. A couple more things because it's getting too good and friendly. Um, Need to hit you one more time. Members of the body that act independently create sickness in the body. You know what happens in the human body when a rogue batch of cells decides to do their own thing. Well, it's the same in the body of Christ. Members that act independently, they create sickness in the body. They create weakness in the body. Members that are healthy in the body, they always compensate for each other. Ever broken a bone? I broke my ankle once. I was hang gliding out of a plane at 35,000. No, I was shoveling my driveway. That's why I don't like snow. And I fell and I broke my ankle and I still remember it. And I still feel it sometimes. And you know what happened? The other members of the body compensated for that broken ankle for a while. They had to. Or I was going to lay in bed and be a pain in the neck to Beverly. So they had to. In the body of Christ, the members that are healthy... We compensate for each other. We compensate for the weak ones. We don't criticize or condemn the weak ones. We compensate for them. And finally, above all else, this is true in Paul's anatomy lesson. Even in a flawed church like Corinth, even when you can look around and say, I'm not sure we got this right, even in a flawed church, we need each other. Every one of us do. Would you jump to your feet and uh, as quickly as you can, lay your hand on somebody beside you and let's lift our voices right now. I want to pray over you before we go. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the body of Christ.